Our calling as children of God is deeply grounded on God's unconditional love and grace for all so that we can serve our neighbors with all of who we are. This is a gift and a task towards fullness of life for all. We are made new every day and always by a God whose love for all is so valuable that God sent God's only begotten Son to live among us. This is our hope that we believe in the promise of the fullness of life from God because of Jesus Christ's life, death, and resurrection. As Lutherans, we are not afraid to face this broken and sometimes violent world because of Jesus Christ. For Martin Luther, our life is a journey, always reforming, and that we are continue to grow in faith and relationship with God and one another. He wrote, This life, therefore, is not righteousness, but growth in righteousness, not health, but healing, not being, but becoming, not rest, but exercise. We are not yet what we shall be, but we are growing toward it. The process is not yet finished, but it is going on. This is not the end, but it is the road. All does not yet gleam in glory, but all is being purified. Good morning and welcome to worship on Sunday, June 27th, the fifth Sunday after Pentecost. Um, it is a jazz service in person, first time we've had one of those in a while. And we're also celebrating Lesbian, Gay, Transgender, Bisexual Pride Month at our 1030 service this morning. Um, just a few announcements. There are all kinds of signups on the bulletin board here. 
um, for you to look at. Some have been taken down that were filled up. Thank you for those um, who have signed up for those things. But we still need uh, nursery help occasionally. We need altar guild people. Uh, we need uh, altar flower sign up. We need ushers. So if you'd like to do any of those things, um, please sign up on the bulletin board or email me at dudley at firstlutheranKC.com. Trying to remember my email address there. Um, it is Christmas in July, so you can visit the small Christmas tree in the narthex for gift ideas for the MLM Christmas store. And uh, they're also looking for school supplies to be delivered to children in August um, or handed out to children in August. So if you can bring any of those things, please do so. If you would like to know what some of the ideas for the Christmas tree uh, that are on the Christmas tree are, please email me again at Dudley First at FirstLutheranKC.com. Uh, the book club is meeting at First Lutheran and is welcoming new members if you would like to join. So there's all kinds of information in the email that we sent you. Um, and one last thing, a word about masks. Uh, following guidance from the Center for Disease Control, <clears throat> masks are optional at both services to those who are fully vaccinated. If you have not yet received your vaccinations, uh, please protect yourselves and others by wearing a mask. We do have masks here at church, so if you choose to come to church in-person services, um, please uh, heed those, uh, that advice. Um, I hope you all have a great week, um, and we hope to see you soon. Hello and welcome to this service for Pride Month. We begin with a litany for unity. In Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. When Peter entered the house of Cornelius, he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation, but God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, everyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him up on the third day and commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles, for they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. God shows no partiality, and so neither shall we. People of all gender identities and sexual orientations are welcome here, as Christ is the host here, and Christ welcomes all.
first reading is a reading from the third chapter of Lamentations. <clears throat> the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for one to bear the yoke in youth, to sit alone in silence when the Lord has imposed it, to put one's mouth to the dust, there may yet be hope, to give one's cheek to the smiter and be filled with insults. For the Lord will not reject forever. Although he causes grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love for he does not willingly afflict or grieve anyone. The word of the Lord. The second reading is a reading from the eighth chapter of 2 Corinthians. Now as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in utmost eagerness, and in our love for you, so we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. <clears throat> I do not say this as a command, but I am testing the genuineness of your love against the earnestness of others. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. And in this matter I am giving my advice. It is appropriate for you who began last year not only to do something, but even to desire to do something, now finish doing it, so that your eagerness may be matched by completing it according to your means. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. I do not mean that there should be relief for others and pressure on you, but it is a question of a fair balance between your present abundance and their need, so that their abundance may be for your need in order that there may be a fair balance. As it is written, the one who had much did ha not have too much, and the one who had little did not have too little. The word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel according to the 10th chapter of Luke. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. The Gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Some might ask why a day like today is necessary. There is a certain quietistic strain of thinking which will say, well, of course we accept everyone, but why do we need to talk about it? Can't we just assume that everyone is welcome and talk about other things? But I believe that the reason why it is very appropriate to celebrate this day is as a corrective to what has come before. Because so much harm has been done in the name of doctrine and dogma. Because in too many years, the word church carries with it not the idea of God's love or God's welcome, God's open table, but thoughts about judgment, the threat of damnation, exclusion, self-doubt. And if we're not bold in our proclamation otherwise, it will be those negatives that echo in our silence. We must be bold in saying that where the church has caused harm and hurt, that we were wrong. That where the church has brought suffering to folks who are LGBTQ, we were wrong. That Jesus' message of love and acceptance has been obscured in the past by prejudice and that we say no to that long and troubled past by celebrating boldly that God has made us all one body in Jesus' name. What must I do to inherit eternal life? That is a rich question. It doesn't just mean how can I live forever. If that were the case, Jesus may have given advice about whole grains and fresh vegetables, but it's a question more about the length of life. Eternal life is a Life touched by the eternal. It's not just about what happens after we die, but about living here and now in connection with what is eternal, a life touched by heaven, touched by God. That's why the answer that the lawyer gives to his own question has to do with the life lived here in the now. By the way, a lawyer in this context would have been a religious figure, an expert in the laws of the Hebrew Bible. Since there were 613 distinct laws found in those holy texts, it required some people to study them and to help the others understand what God's calling as found in their scriptures was. And yet it's telling that the summary this lawyer gives of what he reads in the law of God, this summary with which Jesus wholeheartedly agrees, has to do with love. What this expert in the Bible found when he read the law, underpinning and yet beyond all the laws about when to wash your hands and what to eat, who to marry and who not to, 
was the love of God and the love of neighbor. For a minute, it seems like this lawyer has talked himself out of a job. He has found and expressed what he believes to be the core message of the Bible so simply, so succinctly, he won't be needed again. If you love, you will be led by your own heart to do those things which God most wishes you to do. I think that all of us in our hearts know this has to be true. Jesus points out to the lawyer that he already knows the answer to his own question, and so does everyone else who knows the heart of God. But in an effort to still seem useful, the lawyer asks another question, who then is my neighbor? What goes into answering that question? What metrics do we use? Where have we answered that question wrongly? And what do we need to do about it? In the time and place where I grew up, there were those who answered the questions about who was their neighbor using skin color. The layout of Kansas City still carries the scars of similar thoughts. When I was in college, the September 11th attacks occurred, and a group of people defaced the mosque near our campus. But many of us were hurt by this action. The people who attended that mosque were literally our neighbors, our classmates, our teachers, but this terrible attack had led some to draw new lines about who was and who was not their neighbor. And yes, it has been the case and continues to be the case that some make decisions about who is and who is not their neighbor based on gender identity and sexuality. Jesus answers the question by telling the parable of the Good Samaritan. The phrase Good Samaritan has become so common that it's often used of people doing random acts of kindness. A person who returns a, a lost phone or wallet is a good Samaritan. But we miss the force of what Jesus is saying if we don't know that the Jewish people and the Samaritans absolutely despised one another. The Samaritans were the people of the northern kingdom, which had separated from the southern one in the year 930 B.C. They had a capital city called Samaria, which was eventually conquered by the Assyrians in about the year 700 B.C. The Assyrians brought in Gentile colonists. Intermarriage started to happen. The Gentiles brought with them belief in pagan gods and idols for worship. It came to be the fact that the God of Israel was worshipped in Samaria, but he was worshipped alongside the gods of many other nations. So for many Jewish people living in Jesus' time, Samaritans would have been considered worse than Gentiles. Gentiles at least were totally ignorant of God and God's ways. The Samaritans knew the truth and mocked it by not honoring it as the truth alone. Samaritans, in other words, did not come in good. There was no such thing as a good Samaritan. Some of you know what it's like to be told that nothing good can come from you because of who you are. But Jesus flips the narrative. A priest passes by first. As a priest, he would have been acquainted with all the things of the temple, with worship, with the reading of God's word. But in this case, those things have not informed the way he lives his life. He passes by. The wounded man is not his neighbor. A Levite next comes by. He is the one of the holy tribe who cared for the temple, served as guards and singers and teachers. But whatever good work he may have done elsewhere, it is not applied to the wounded man. He passes by. But then a Samaritan came and fulfilled God's word. God's love was active in a life that others would not have expected it to be active in. God's will was being fulfilled by a person whom others thought could never please God. God was being wonderfully witnessed to in care and wine and oil, time and effort, God's love becoming incarnate and visible in an act of neighborliness. By telling this story, Jesus is challenging people's assumption. He's pointing out the reality that God's will is fulfilled where love and mercy happen and not behind the boundaries that we artificially create. Being a neighbor isn't defined by where you live, who you're related to, what your religion you are, your skin color, your gender identity, your sexuality, your political beliefs, or how much money you have in the bank. According to Jesus, neighbor is almost more a verb than it is a noun. 
We create neighbors by being neighborly. Our neighbors are those we love in God's name with all our hearts and minds and all of our strength. We don't look for neighbors. We don't decide who our neighbors are based on qualities or characteristics. We make them through what we do by showing mercy and by showing love. Go and do likewise, Jesus says to the lawyer, but he's also saying it to us. Today's gospel comes with a homework assignment because this is not stuff to be talked about, but stuff to be lived. So on the other side of all human-made boundaries, let us follow God's law, which is love, and let us be neighbors to all of the world. As people proclaim beloved, whole, beautifully and wonderfully made, let us be guided by the divine towards the fullness of this day and life, and let us lift our hearts and voices in prayer and celebration. Graced with abundance through Christ, we give thanks for the uniqueness and strength of the LGBTQIA community. Our siblings have been gifted with fruits of the Spirit and embody the fullness of God's endless diversity. We look to our siblings as they show us what it means to live in relationship with you and with one another. God of grace, hear our prayer. God who invites us to work for justice, we give thanks for our allies. When we work together, we are stronger together. Help our LGBTQIA siblings and allies continue to lend their time, talents, and abilities to this world. Fill up their cups and provide them with the endurance to move others towards a place of compassion and love. For all your people. God of grace, hear our prayer. Divine breath of life, you have invited us into relationship, not to condemn and judge, but to love and to care. Help us extend your grace to all people and to welcome those the world has labeled as other. 
May all people experience the unity of your love and be brought into a life and calling with one another as you have first loved us. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of the people, you have made us in your image and you call us good. Thank you for your people who are able to live out their authentic witness to be the people you lovingly created them to be and the bravery instilled in their hearts which allows them to move in the world in their own amazing way. We pray today for those who are not yet able to live in their fullness and we comfort them with our love. Remind us each day the ways we are called to welcome, include, celebrate, and advocate for your whole kingdom. God of grace, hear our prayer. Let us now confess our sin. Giver of life in the midst of life exploited by greed and abuse of power, have mercy on us. Giver of life in the midst of life shortened by hate and exclusion, have mercy on us. Giver of life in the midst of life groaning for fullness and dignity, have mercy on us. Giver of life, you created us all in your image and we squandered that gift and the whole humanity and creation lament with us, have mercy on us. When God created the whole creation, God saw that it was good, God loved it, and continues to love all. May the giver of life make all things new through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Now let us pray using the words our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The blessing of God, who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us, be upon you now and forever.